Good evening, everybody. Hello. Good evening. I'm just letting everyone join us as usual. Give it just a moment. Evening all, we're just letting everyone come into the webinar before we get going. Numbers still going up. Okie doke, I think we're about there. So good evening, everybody. Um, welcome back to the next installment of our Nature Trek Winter Roadshow. Um, well, it's felt positively spring-like here in Hampshire today, which does herald that the Winter Roadshow is about to come to an end. Um, it's our penultimate one tonight, so there's one more to go after this, but plenty to bring you this evening. Um, over the last few years, oh, last two years, we've all been pretty much confined to the British Isles here. I'm sure some of you are joining us from abroad, but the majority of us have been um, stuck on our lovely island here for some time now. Um, I think we've all found a, a new appreciation of our local wildlife and we've been getting out and about and enjoying it. Um, it was back in, Ju I think, June, July 2020 when we first launched our UK day trips. Um, they all stemmed from it was almost a challenge amongst our operations team in the office. We wondered who could be the first person to, to run a tour post lockdown one. Um, and we, we equipped that perhaps Tom, who's joining us tonight, should round up five clients and take the Forest of Dean for a day and he could win the challenge. Two days later, we sent out an e-shot with our first few day trips. Three minutes later, we got our first booking and then the phone rang solidly for two days. Since then, we've taken hundreds, well, we've run hundreds of day trips, taken thousands of clients all over the UK. And with our women's clip, we've been busily organising more and more UK breaks for you all. Um, it was already one of our most popular destinations before we started um, having to deal with COVID, and it remains so today. Nothing's changed on that front for the last two years. So tonight, I think it's almost a celebration of our, our local wildlife, and we're going to take you to some of our favourite destinations around the UK. Uh, so my name is Kerry Porteous. I'm one of our operations managers in the office. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by Tom Mabbitt, and Paul Stanbury and Alison Steele, who are also all box managers in our office, but also lead many of our tours um, around the UK and also further afield. And Matthew Kappa, one of our premier tour leaders, who's joining us from Chesterfield um, and will be speaking last this evening. Um, usual format this evening, we'll be doing two of our talks before the break, um, having 10 minutes to go and refresh drinks and whatnot, and then two more after the break with questions and answers at the end of the evening. Um, you can pop them in the chat as usual, you can put them in the Q&A box, we might answer a few as we go along, and then we'll wrap up lots of them um, at about five past nine at the end of the evening. So, without further ado, further ado, I will hand over to Tom, who's going to take us off to the Forest of Dean and Somerset Levels to begin with. Over to you, Tom. Brilliant. Thank you, Kerry. And welcome, everyone. Um, so, yeah, once again, my name's Tom Abbott. Um, I'm one of the operations managers. I'm sure lots of you have seen me speaking before. Um, look out for a whole range of, of tours, of course, all across the world. But as Kerry said this evening, we're focusing on the wonderful wildlife that we have here um, in, the, in, in the British Isles. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on, first of all, the, the wonderful Forest of Dean um, and, then, and then move on to the, the Somerset levels. And the Forest of Dean is, it's sort of, it's not really my home patch. I'm talking to you from Cheltenham now, so it's around a, about a 40 minute drive uh, from Cheltenham, the Forest of Dean. I've spent a lot of time there. I set, when I joined Nature Trek in 2013, I set up the, 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 the two night tour uh, to the Forest of Dean that we run in the winter and the spring. Uh, which has proved very popular, looking for the, the, the wonderful bird life and some, some, some great mammals as well. Um, and it's just a, yeah, a brilliant place. So it's, the Forest of Dean is, is, is the, the second largest sort of tract of ancient forest in, in England, second to the, the New Forest. And it's, it's around 45 uh, square miles um, of, of forest in, in Western Gloucestershire. Um, and it's a, it, it's a, it's a really, it's a really special place. It's a, pretty much a, a mix of, of dis, you know, an equal split of deciduous um, and coniferous forests, lots of brilliant food trees for the birds coming in the winter, and it has some very special species returning, you know, very soon around now, returning to the forest to uh, to, to breed. And um, so we base ourselves before the Forest of Dean tour at the Speech House Hotel, right in the heart of the forest. There's very little um, driving on this tour. It's one of the things that are, you know, elements I really enjoy about it. You can see so much just walking, you know, out the front of the hotel. Um, lovely walks just you know, without you know, you know, barely heading anywhere. Lots of um, open glades, um, sort of heath, heathlands, um, obviously these amazing forest walks, 
um, lakes and streams, lots of different habitats and, and, yeah, and so many you know, brilliant species to find. Here is a, a photo of the, of the Speech House Hotel, um, very ancient, uh, very old um, you know, hotel used by the Verderers for, for many hundreds of years to sort of make rulings and decisions on, the, on what happens in the, in the forest and that still happens uh, to, this, to this day. It's a nice scenic of the of the forest. As I said, it's a it, it's pretty much a, a split of, of of coniferous and deciduous uh, uh, woodland, and lots of you know, lots of lovely lovely walks to enjoy. One of the things I like, particularly on the, on the winter tours, is is just getting to grips with the with, with the common species. There's some star species I've come to, but I always carry around a bag of seed with me on the winter trips, and we'll head to a spot and I'll just throw down some seed and just watch all the woodland birds piling in around your feet. Um, nuthatch here, beautiful nuthatch that you know comes in less though. They're, they're often so tame, just hopping around your feet uh, and, and, and a, a really brilliant chance to see some of these species very, very close up and in, in, in great numbers, uh, particularly on our, you know, on our winter tours. We'll get to groups with the, with the, with the sort of more common woodland uh, tit species, marsh tit here. Um, I'm watching you know, all the other tit species you know, pile in on the, on the seed is great. There'll be tree creepers in, in such great numbers. Often people comment, blind me off. I've seen more tree creepers on this weekend tour than I've seen in my life before. They just seem to be everywhere. And there's just a really great density of your, of your sort of more um, yeah, you know, common um, you know, woodland birds. Um, so in the, in the winter months, it's, it's probably been a more popular, this, this tour in the winter. It's brilliant in, both, in, in all seasons, but we probably run more departures in the winter. And it's a, a feature of the winter tours are, are the sort of finch species. There's a beautiful male sisk in here feeding on an alder. And there's lots of what I call the, the sort of the, the good food trees, alders and, and, and yew and hornbeam and beech. And these food trees really attract the, um, the, 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 the finches in the winter. So these birds will pile in from Europe um, and, and make the most of the bounty that can be found um, in, the, in the forest of Dean. And we'll often find big flocks of, 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 of chattering siskins with red poles in amongst them as well often. I mean, it's, it's great fun. The, the, the forest can just be alive with, with the noise of the flight calls of finches. Brilliant opportunity to learn the different um, flight calls of the birds we're hearing and, uh, and, and find them feeding as well. And one of the birds I've probably spent more time you know, tracking down in my life than any other is, is probably the wonderful hawfinch. And I absolutely love hawfinch, brilliant bird um, and really cracking chance of, of seeing them in the forest. I'm not sure we've ever missed hawfinch on our on our winter tour. So again, they breed in the forest um, in, 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 pretty, in, in pretty good numbers, they sort of nest in sort of loose colonies, you often have sort of two or three, four nests, you know, fairly close to each other, little clusters of, uh, of them, and, uh, but their numbers are bolstered, you know, in, in the winter months um, with, with birds coming in from Europe. So the, the UK's largest um, yeah, finch species, of course, is big, heavy, silvery bill. This is a male here, with this sort of more bright, um, gingery, golden head. Um, and that, that, that whacking great bill is strong enough to, to get through, you know, crack through even a, a cherry stone. But if you find the yew trees in particular and the hornbeam and beech, you've got a great chance of finding hawfinch. On day trips this winter, I had, you know, flock in excess of 30 birds. I think 32 was the, was the maximum count on, on, a, on day trip this winter. So, yeah, fantastic, fantastic bird. Crossbill as well is a, is a real feature. And pretty much at any time of year, they breed quite early in the very early in the year. So we've got a good uh, a good chance of a uh, very good chance of finding them. So this is a male, um, beautiful brick red colour, and then the females that sort of yeah greeny, um, yeah, yellowy colour. This one just just teasing out a, a seed from this uh, from this larch cone here. Brilliant, brilliant birds. Almost parrot like the way they sort of cl clamber around the branches and hold the cones with their um, with their feet. There, brilliant, brilliant birds. Bramblings will come in, been a very good winter for bramblings actually this, this winter, um, every, in, in, in varying numbers. Some winters, you know, you'll be scratching around trying to find brambling. Other winters, you know, they'll be all over the place. It's been, yeah, it's been, it's been very good for them, for them this year, coming in from, from Europe and just spending the winter here. Beautiful male, um, you know, brambling here. Lovely bird with that, the orangey, or, orangey wash there on the, on the upper breast there. Lovely. Um, great grey shrike we might find most winters, actually, unfortunately, this winter, first time in, I think, five winters that, uh, that, that, that we couldn't find one. It's been, not been a good winter, actually, from a great grey shrike, sort of nationwide this winter. But generally speaking, we have great, uh, great success with finding great grey shrike um, out on the glades in the forest. Um, and it's been really fascinating returning to the glade and finding um, the area where they, where they, where they larder their, their prey. Um, known as the, 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 the butcher bird, of course, of course. So they'll you know, make hay while the sun shines. They'll, they'll catch lots of uh, you know, various different 
prey items and, and larder that prey for when times are trickier, some harsh weather um, hits and they'll, they'll have that, uh, that larder of food to, to fall back on. So this is a, a, a photo taken by a group member on one of the day trips um, the, the winter before this. Um, I, think, I think it was a vole, it was definitely some mammal species that have been um, in, impaled here. And there's a couple of little blackthorn bushes over the years that is just, you can almost guarantee you're going to find some remains of some um, poor and you know, unfortunate animals. This is almost certainly a, um, a, a wood mouse with the length of that tail there. But in these, in, in these, uh, in the, in these bushes, I've found you know, you know, bees, newts, lizards, um, stone chat, siskin, goldfinch. These, the, 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 the shrikes really feed on quite a um, you know, very wide range of, of different species very varied diet and it's, it's fascinating each, each visit trying to figure out you know what, what, what exactly has been uh, has been impaled and they'll return to these areas to to feed so a, a really yeah a, a real feature um, of, a, of a visit in the winter is trying to find um, the, the, the wonderful great grey shrike. Lesser spotted woodpecker at the start of the weekend was you know, I often you know, will say you know, what are you most hoping to see and get it get, get to grips with what people are after and lesser spotted woodpecker tends to crop up and it's it's a they breed in the forest, um, in, in you know, in still in, in pretty good numbers. But uh, yeah, of course they're, you know, they're very very tricky to find. You know, about the size of a sparrow, and they're just you know, you're a brilliant brilliant little bird. You can just see a little bit of red on the crown here, uh, making this uh, making this a male. Um, and it really takes now is prime time for finding lesser spotted woodpeckers. Getting out very early, you know, they they tend to stop drumming and calling. You know, often you know before before eight o'clock in my experience even and. You know, not much after that, and so get out and uh, and and, uh, and try and try and find them now is the is the time. We'll visit Simmons Yacht. There's a beautiful view along the Y here. And when I was at school, this was the place to go to see peregrines. We're now blessed with them um, in in lots of our towns and cities, um, but this was the the place to see uh, to see peregrine. We'll, we'll we'll visit to 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 see the pair that, that, that breed there every year. And goshawk often displaying over the woodlands, in, in, in particularly you know during the you know February March time around around now. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cracking place to, to spend a bit of time. Beautiful peregrine falcon there. What a bird. Onto the mammals, wild boar uh, uh, is you know, very, very high on the, on the wish list of, of anyone visiting the Forest of Dean. And there are species that are, um, yeah, don't go down too well with the locals, um, uh, but visitors, visitors love them. And I love them every time I see one, it's a, it's a thrill. And um, there's thought to be around 1,200 animals now. They were, re they were released Around 20 of them were released in 1999 was the date that they put on the uh, initial sort of release of a few animals. And it used to be very exciting to find an area of grass that had been turned over by wild boar. Um, but now it's it's almost unusual to find an area that hasn't been turned over by, by wild boar. Um, but saying that, they're still pretty tricky to find. Often people are surprised. They, they are very much wild. Um, they will charge away at any sign of, of humans and, and, and hide away. And we, it tends to be that we have to get out after dark spotlighting. Um, for them, just driving around with a with a pretty powerful torch, um, shining around and then trying to find find boar. It's a big big sow here. You can see where they've she's turned over the ground. But always exciting getting out at night a uh, night drive around the forest of Dean for um, for for wild boar. They've they've they've, uh, they've also released uh, you know another exciting mammal. I don't have a photo of, but they've released pine martin in the forest of Dean as well. Um, so there's a they're, they're, which are being very closely monitored um, and are doing uh, are doing well. So that that could be a, a feature of a, a future tour maybe in a in a few years, but a few a few more sightings starting to, to happen with, uh, with, uh, with, with pine martin. We'll, we'll like to see fallow deer, it's the dominant deer species, row and muntjac just moving in in the last few years from the farm, you know, more sort of farmland open ground outside the forest. And in the spring, we're gonna have species such as um, pie flycatcher here returning to breed, um, wood warbler, a beautiful cascading song you know, that, that they make, red start, and lots of these species that will have that have wintered in in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and then moved back to the forest um, to to breed. What a stunning bird the male red start is. A bird that's been done very well is the firecrest. Its range has sort of increased, it's doing well, you know, across the country. Um, it used to be very rare in the forest, now breeds in very good numbers as its range is is moving. You know, certainly moving uh, moving north. It used to be very much a right in the right in the south uh, species, but doing very well. And a real feature of our summer, of our summer tours is getting out onto a glade at night, and uh, and and listening and watching out for for, for the wonderful night jar. And this was from a day trip, um, yeah, la last summer, and uh, got lucky scanning all scan the stumps. Try try luck scanning the the tree stumps, and and it, and it paid off on this evening. Lovely view of one 
um, perched and the males get up and make, you know, make that beautiful churring sound and will float overhead with those white wing flashes and wing clapping and yeah what a what a brilliant bird often woodcock roading as well so it's a fantastic experience butterflies we hope to encounter in the in the spring and summer of you know, wood white here and also small pearl border fritillary just some of the two of the star species and uh, and and also adder always include a include a snake slide on my my talks and this is it for tonight this is a, a young male adder that we've that we encountered um, February March is a very good time just coming out of, of, of the hibernation we often uh, we often see them in, in those months so that's the forest of Dean in a nutshell um, yeah we, we run winter and, and and spring and summer visits for, for two nights and we also run two night tours to the Somerset levels across the winter um, and the and the spring and summer months as well um, just down the road uh, in the uh, in the Somerset levels and actually recently we we, we, we have a tour that combines the both of them it's so actually three nights in each location um, and it gives you a wonderful you know range of species and covering a really diverse range of habitats um, on that one so the Somerset levels really reminds me you know, quite a bit of, a, of, of the Camargue in southwestern France I've been lucky to lead a few tours out there and the levels just keep getting better year on year uh, for me um, lots of different reserves managed by different you know organizations the RSPB the wildlife trusts um, natural England and they and then they're really going from you know from strength to strength and uh, and yeah it's a, a brilliant place it's a vast open uh, reed beds and, and waterways and then lots of these islands created when they were you know former peat excavations on some of these sites that have been now turned into nature reserves have created lots of these islands you can see here and that's perfect for breeding birds you know predators can't get there and and, and find the nests and the, and the wildlife um, just goes from you know just just booms um, pardon the pun so where are we? Um, we are we base ourselves in wells and we're really the, the Somerset Levels is really a vast floodplain of these three rivers, the River Axe, the River Brew and the River Parrot, which of course are, the, the area is designed to you know, flood every winter and it brings in lots of, 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 of waders and, and wildfowl and it's yeah it's it's, it's superb you know, across the seasons really. We base ourselves in wells just opposite the cathedral um, in, in Wells and it's a uh, yeah, this bird is a feature of the winter tours, of course. Mo most people that visit in the winter have, have, have this species on their mind, this, this, the, the starling. And what a, what a lovely bird it is, very underrated species. Look at the plumage there of a, of a beautiful starling. But the draw of the Somerset Levels is the largest starling roost in, in the country, sometimes numbering up to a million birds. So to see that number together, um, often in the sort of yeah, six, seven, eight hundred thousand birds, sometimes even getting up to around a million, absolutely incredible, um, is is one of the, the UK's, you know, undoubtedly one of the UK's sort of finest wildlife wildlife spectacles. It differs on every visit. I've been, you know, many times to see the, 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 the starlings um, there. And some evenings I'll come straight into the reeds fairly quickly, you know, piling in low. Other times I make these amazing murmurations where they'll dance and twist and turn, make these incredible shapes in the sky before diving into the reed beds. Absolutely amazing. And, uh, and I highly recommend that if you haven't done it. And then we'll return in the morning and watch the starlings burst out of the reeds the morning the, you know, the morning rise and they'll just you know just dart off in every single you know every direction and um, the noise and the whole experience of returning early in the morning is is as impressive for me as, as the evening and we, we make we make an effort to do that for those that are those that are keen to get up very very early but it's uh, yeah what an amazing experience going and seeing starlings um, yeah, performing like that, of roosting and, and leaving their roost. As I said, it's brilliant for wild for wildfowl. I've got a real soft spot for, for wildfowl. I worked at, at Slimbridge for, for a short time, and I love my wildfowl. A flock of widgeon here, of course. And this is sort of a, a classic scene at some of the some of the reserves. Big numbers of you sort of dabbling, you dabbling ducks. Um, you, there's you know, gadwall here, shoveler, teal, widgeon. There's probably a, you know, a pintail lurking around in there somewhere. Beautiful drake, drake pintail. Very very. Um, good for your for your, for your wildfowl um, and and some waders as well. Big numbers of, of gold plover and lapwing as well in the in in the winter months. Bearded tit are doing you know much you know better year on year as the reed beds are developing and, and getting older. More mature, we're seeing bearded tits more often on our um, on our visits to the Somerset levels and common crane as well. It was actually while while I was working at uh, at Slimbridge back in it was 2008 2009 when they were doing the you know the, the the, the great crane project they called it where the eggs were brought in from germany the, the the crane were reared at slimbridge and then released onto the somerset levels and there's now a, um, a population 
on, on the levels and we can we can really hope and expect to see them on our you know on, on both our winter and our spring and summer uh, visits uh, to see to see these uh, magnificent birds and that lovely call that sort of bugling call as they as they fly over you know magnificent to have them back 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 on the levels bitterns are doing well uh, winter and summer is, is very good to see them probably more often there's there's more numbers in the winter with birds coming from europe but they're more frequently seen in the in in the spring and summer when they're breeding when they're making flights over the reed beds more often so a great chance of, uh, of catching up with bittern and as i said it's like the Camargue. this is a little bittern I took a photo of a, a number of years ago and some rare species breed there lots of um, these sort of more european herons are now colonizing um with the levels great white egret um, very common very commonly seen on, on the somerset levels um, as well as cattle egret as well. I think there's a, a record of yeah, two, three hundred cattle egret recently on the levels, quite incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really, really going well there. Marsh harrier is almost, uh, yeah, almost always uh, yeah, very frequently seen scanning, you know, scanning over the, uh, over the reed beds. In, this, in, in, this, in the spring and summer months, that's sort of covering the winter. In the, we've got some you know, tours coming up you know, you know, fairly soon and we're going to be you know, enjoying all the birds that have come here to breed and the reed beds just become alive with the with, with the songs of, of lots of different species and it's a brilliant trip if you want to get to grips with with when you, you know, learn some more you know bird song uh, it's it's a super trip for us so you have sedge warbler and reed warbler here so they'll be they'll be blasting away in the reeds and and, and, and hedgerows and thickets um, and, and and cuckoo as well will we'll often turn it's a lovely atmosphere when you turn up at first light onto some of some of these reserves on the, on the Somerset levels, and just listen to the, all those different, um, you know, all that different bird song. You know, white throats, gar, you know, garden warblers, you know, Bichetti's warbler, you know, cuckoo in calling, bitterns booming. It's a, it's, it's just a, yeah, it's a, it's a super, a super experience. Gargany coming back, they're they're, they're coming into the country now. Um, when they so they they, they pass through, and, and they thought a, a, you know, small numbers. Uh, will breed there and in the summer months is very good for um for, for dragonflies sometimes see in excess of you know, we see, you know 12 13 species you know frequently on our on our tours this is variable um dams will fly here um four spotted um chaser and scarce chaser as well and we'll see lots of other lots of other species of, of, of dragonfly as we enjoy exploring these different uh, these different reserves and with them uh, we with all the dragonflies brings big numbers of hobbies you know, often see you know, you have really high counts of, of hobbies, 20, 30 birds, even more than that on occasion, um, as they're you know, passing through the levels, feeding on all these uh, on all these insects. So that's the, the, the Forest of Dean and the Somerset levels in a nutshell, two you know, brilliant destinations and highly, highly recommend a visit. I'm going to sneak in another another, another uh, you know, destination, now, another tour that's, that we're, we're about to launch, um, the, the, the sort of dates are advertised, and, um, but it's and it's going out in our upcoming newsletter. So the tour to to, to Suffolk to stay at uh, to stay at Bordsey Hall that featured on the on the recent um, uh, Winter Watch series, and we're going to we're going to be staying um, just taking over the place for for for, for a small nature trek group, um, and to and to explore this this fantastic area and to take you know take advantage of their of their two fantastic hides and have exclusive use of these. Of these hides to some and to see some of the of the nocturnal wildlife in particular, I call it Suffolk by night. So it's a, a new offering. We're always adding you know, new ideas and new destinations to our you know, to our port, to our portfolio, and this is this is just one of those. So I've just run through a couple of really great photos I was sent recently, um, in the as I'm sort of writing up and and, and developing this uh, this new tour. Really good chance of actually seeing a, of, of seeing polecat, um, which you might have seen featured on that uh, on the on, on the Winter Watch series. We'll spend you know, a couple of evenings. We won't spend all night, but we'll we'll spend uh, two evenings going on until sort of eleven o'clock midnight, uh, maybe even later, to see what comes in uh, around the um, uh, around the, uh, the the pond they've got there in the area to take some uh, beautiful photos like this. And in the daytime, just get out exploring and, and, and you know birding um, the, the the local area. Beautiful shot of a, of a badger there coming down to the to the pond in front of the hide. A bit of interaction there with the with with the fox and badger, and a cheeky little polecat looking up over at the, uh, at the at the badger there. So that's that's a new offering. It's going to be a four night tour. I'm exploring that uh, that fantastic area, just about 45-50 minutes south of uh, of Minsmere. Explore the reserves in the day. Get out for night jars in the evening, 
and man to have a couple of, of sessions in these uh, in these fantastic hides. That's a that's a new one. So I'll leave you there. I'm going to to, to hand over now. Thanks very much for listening, and I uh, hope you can yeah, join us on a, you know, on a on a on a tour in the future. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Right. I'm going to take over now and. Just share my screen, so bear with you one second. Right. Hopefully that's all working. Good. Paul, Paul, I'll just stop you there. We've yep. got your um, presenter view showing. If you oh. just come out of it completely, there might be two windows um, when you share screen. Right. It's Sorry. Totally close down your. Try again. This technology always gets me. How's that? Perfect. Off you go. Okay. <laughs> good. Thank you very much, Kerry. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much for, for, for tuning in tonight. Uh, my name is Paul Stanbury. Um, I've been with Nature Trek now for, uh, for about 26 years. Um, and um, yeah, I'll be spending the next 15, 20 minutes just talking through some of our tours to, to Norfolk and the, and the new forest um, as, as well. We've been operating trips to both of these areas um, for pretty much as long as I've been, been with the company so they're regions we're very familiar with we've got some great local guides who, who um, live locally know the reserves really well know that the the wildlife and do a do a great job um, leading our tours so I'm going to start with them um, with Norfolk um, you know, arguably um, the UK's premier birding county um, or bird watchers throughout the country. Um, um, most have probably visited Norfolk over the years. It's almost a pilgrimage to, to go there and uh, enjoy the, the fantastic um, habitats and, and, and bird life that, uh, that uh, abounds. Um, and it's a great county to visit th throughout the year. Um, and so we operate tours here pretty much throughout the year. Um, we have our, our winter trips that run from November through February and into March, we've got spring tours um, and um, and trips in the in the autumn as well. And the the photo I've got here is um, um, North Norfolk coastline. So we we run our tours, go and visit um, from the Wash all the way down to uh, to the Norfolk Broads, um, and we enjoy. Uh, um, Um, yeah, um, all of the, the, the key wildlife sites um, in, um, in the county. Um, Norfolk is, is blessed uh, with a, um, some of the, the best wildlife and habitat um, in, in the country. Um, along the, the, north, the North Norfolk coastline, um, and it's lined with um, wetlands and um, um, and, and dune systems, um, woodlands, and these areas that attract uh, new, numerous birds over the over the course of the year. Um, our tours in in the winter time um, are based. Well, we do a range of tours. Um, some are two night breaks based in um, Hunstanton um, on the the north coast, and we have longer five day tours that um, split their time between Hunstanton and, and the Broads. On the, in the winter, we're exploring the wetlands, looking for the huge numbers of, uh, of duck and waterfowl and other birds that, uh, that come down from Siberia and uh, Northern Europe to take advantage of our, our, our milder conditions down here in the UK. Uh, this is the, the hotel we use in Hunstanton. It's the called the Strange Arms. It's right on the um, on the sea. You see from this this photo, and it's a great base um, from which to explore the, the western side of the North Norfolk uh, coastline. 
um, when we're going down to Snettersham, for example, to look at the waders down at the wash or exploring reserves, iconic reserves such as Titchwell or, or Holm or, or Wells. Um, so the whole of the coastline here um, is just a patchwork of, of wetlands and um, wet meadows, dunes um, and the woodland. This is the, um, the, the, the east bank at, at Cly, looking out towards a salt house. Um, marsh harriers are, are common up in Norfolk throughout the year. Um, and they're a, they're a common side quartering the, 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 the reed beds and they, they breed in pretty good numbers as well um, in, in a lot of the reserves. On good days, you need to keep your eyes and ears open for, for bearded tits and their characteristic ping, ping, ping call is uh, the first thing often draws your attention to these, um, these wonderful, wonderful little birds. Um, Norfolk is famous in the winter for its huge concentrations of wintering geese, in particular the pink-footed geese. Um, and one of the real highlights of the trip here in the winter is to see the huge flocks of geese either flying to their to their roost in the in the evening or flying out from the roost first thing in the morning. And the guides know where to go, they don't know where to position you. And that really is uh, one of the real highlights is if you've got a nice day with a nice sunset to watch skein after skein after skein of pink-footed geese um, flying over, wink, wink, winking, wink, wink as they as they go their, their characteristic call on their on their way um, to, to roost. But look out over the sea in the winter time and you hopefully get a see a nice range of, uh, of sea duck um, a beautiful long-tailed duck here um, there are also um, scoter winter off the, off, off, off the sea golden eye um, red, um, um, red-throated diver um, and a range of other other seabirds as well another of the, the real highlights um, in Norfolk in the in the winter and and also early spring, late autumn times, the, the huge concentrations of, of waders um, that, that descend to feed on the, um, on the mudflats of the, of the wash. Um, thousands and thousands of, of knot, these are mostly knots here in this photograph, and, and other waders. And as the tide um, rises, see on if you get a particularly high tide that covers up the mud, then at uh, Snettersham, the spectacle of thousands and thousands of, of waders wheeling around in the sky, Look, not, not unlike the, uh, the huge flocks of starlings that Tom showed you earlier um, in, um, on the Somerset levels. We'll also explore the, the, the dune systems here um, and the, the woodlands um, along the, the, the edge of the coast. Um, in the winter time, the, the dunes are, are home to flocks of, of snow buntings, um, very high little bird that's bred up in the Arctic and or um, a couple of places in, up in Scotland where they breed on the, on the tops of the mountains, but they form little flocks down on the north of the coast in the wintertime, joined by a few Lapland buntings, and if you're lucky, hopefully shorelark as well, uh, which also winter along the, uh, along the coastline here. Um, my favourite bird of all is the, is the waxwing, and uh, we've, we've not had a good waxwing winter now for, for, for many a year. So we must be due um, a, a waxwing eruption at some point over the next few years. Um, and North Norfolk coast, since it faces out, uh, out into the North Sea, is one of their first landfalls for this beautiful bird. So you need to keep your eyes open on the, on the berry bushes, the ornamental berry bushes for the spectacular species. Um, we also do trips down around the Norfolk Broads um, as well as the, uh, as the North Norfolk coastline, but we found a really nice um, guest house called Dairy Barns Guest House, just um, a little way from Hickling, where we base all of our groups on the Broads these days. Very similar bird life down here, you've got a large amount of reed bed full of bearded tits, a bit of breeding here um, and wintering as well, plenty of marsh harriers. Probably the most famous bird of the Broads is the, um, is the crane. Um, and um, on and one evening, we'll take you to um, a, um, a place where uh, the cranes come in um, to roost. Um, and hopefully while we're out here as well, looking for the cranes roosting, we've got a good opportunity of seeing barn owls, which are doing quite well in Norfolk uh, these days. And in the winter, you often get uh, roosts of hen harrier um, as well, and maybe even merlin if you're, if, if you're lucky.
There are mammals too up in Norfolk, um, and we'll be looking go out um, we'll go out to the coast, um, hope to see grey seal, um, and in, we have some trips timed for November when the when the grey seals are pupping, um, and go to visit the reserve at Hickling, sorry not Hickling at Horsey and um, um, Winston Dunes, and look look for the grey seals and their pups. We also do trips to the, um, the, the to Norfolk and so North Norfolk and the Broads in the in the springtime as well, a time of year when all the migrants have arrived and it's the sedge warblers here singing from the uh, from the sedge and the reed warblers are chattering away in the reed beds. Um, the birds are breeding. There's plenty of avocets uh, breeding along um, along the North Norfolk coast and down towards um, the, the Broads. But in spring, we're also going to get a variety of migrant birds um, moving through. So Wimber will come through in, in decent numbers um, at the end of April and into, into May, along with flocks of black-tailed godwits and ruff and a, a wide variety of other, other breeding birds, all resplendent in their breeding plumage as well. Um, there's other things, there's things that are sometimes seen a little bit more unusual, black tern, little gull. And in the spring, we'll go down also into the brecks um, in central Norfolk to look for the, the stone curlews that, 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 that breed here. Um, we also run trips in the autumn, and Norfolk is very famous actually um, for, for, for the birders. It's most famous for its autumn migration. It faces out into the North Sea. If you get an easterly breeze, then the first landfall for the tired birds that are flying across the North Sea is the east coast of Britain and the, the north coast of, of Norfolk. In the, in the autumn, you get a wonderful range of, of waders and, 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 and passerines coming through. We've got green sandpiper, wood sandpiper here on the top left and top right, curly sandpiper, bottom left, and, and rough too. Later on in the autumn, big numbers of thrushes cross the, the North Sea from their breeding grounds up in Scandinavia. So it's the first landfall of our, of our wintering um, 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 field fair and, and red wing. And maybe mixed in amongst them, you'll have a few uh, migrant uh, ring oozles too. But later on in the autumn, late September into October, if you get a decent number amount of eastern winds, um, then you'll be looking out for some of the more rarer species as well. And the North Norfolk coast is, is famous um, amongst bird watchers for its unu the unusual species it turns up um, in the autumn. Um, we've got here yellow-browed warbler on the top left, red-breasted flycatcher top right, wryneck, and red-backed shrike. It's just four of a whole range of, of different Eastern and European species that you might have a chance of finding if you're lucky. And over the years, Norfolk's turned up some incredible rarities. Um, um, the one that, uh, one of the most famous being a bird from far, far to the west, the, uh, the red-breasted nuthatch. Um, that turned up in, at, uh, at Holcombe um, in 19, 1989. So that's just a, a sort of brief overview of the, of the wildlife bird highlights of Norfolk. Um, so we do a range of trips throughout the year. Um, I'm just going to finish now with just a few images on one of my favourite areas, um, the, the New Forest National Park, a place I've been visiting um, ever since I was a, I was a small boy. Um, the wildlife here, the birds I'm going to show you are actually quite similar to, to the wildlife and the birds that, that Tom showed you for the, uh, for the Forest of Dean, but it's very but similar habitats. It's a large area of, 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 of woodland and uh, lowland heath and bog. and was actually proclaimed um, as a royal hunting reserve by William the Conqueror in around seven, 1079. It's been mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Um, it covers 220 miles of uh, woodland. Um, wood pasture and lowland heaths, um, and it's still managed under the ancient pastoral system, it includes grazing rights, and it's, it, it's this uh, very ancient way of managing the land that's, that's helped to preserve the character and the wildlife in the forest. Um, as with Norfolk, we run trips here throughout the year, uh, winter, spring, um, and, and the autumn. And this is quite a classic view of the new forest, looking out as was particular spot is up at Acres Down, looking out over the heath and over a, a large area of mixed broadleaf woodland. Um, and um, we stay in some really nice accommodation in the New Forest. Um, this is the Beauty Hotel, um, just south of, of, of Lindhurst. 
a nice hotel with good, good, um, uh, nice rooms. And we'll explore the, 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 the forest, um, the, the deciduous and, the, and also the managed forest of the new forest. Um, it has some beautiful old beach uh, woodlands and mixed beech and oak woods as well, home to the classic uh, woodland birds of the UK. Um, we've got a wood warbler, uh, top left, sadly a bird that has, that has declined markedly in the new forest over the years. It was a common bird and I was going there as a kid. Now, difficult bird to find, sadly. But if you're lucky, you'll still hear the, the, the silvery trill of the, of the wood warbler um, in the spring. Commoner are the uh, common red star to the right. Um, and then of course, the more familiar woodland birds such as nuthatch and uh, marsh tit as well. Although the wood warblers fared very badly, um, a bird that's actually fared very well over the years is the, uh, is the firecrest. And now this is a common breeding bird in the New Forest. In fact, it was in the New Forest that the first record of breeding firecrest in the, in the UK um, was found back in the 1960s at, at Boulderwood. But if you've got your ears tuned in now to, to firecrest, that very high pitched trill um, they, uh, uh, they sing, then it's, it's a bird you can see all over the place. Um, one of the most sought after birds in the new forest uh, is, the, is the honey buzzard. Um, and these are very late migrants. They come in mid to, to late May. Um, and um, there are a few spots to go in the forest where um, you stand a reasonable chance of seeing this, um, this, this very localized raptor. We'll also take you out onto the extensive lowland heathlands uh, as well. Um, looking for some of the special birds of, of this area, so birds like woodlark, um, common, um, commonly seen the bird is in full song at the moment, so, but a heath and fairly close to where I live and the woodlarks are, are really um, and in full song um, on nice days. One of the, the, the classic bird of the New Forest is the, the beautiful little Dartford warbler. Um, the New Forest is the centre, the hub, really, of the Dartford warbler population in the country. And they're very susceptible to cold winters. So when you get a cold winter, the range of Dartfords in, in the, the warbler in the UK retract back down to the south and particularly down to the New Forest. Um, well, they favour the, um, the heathlands, dotted, dotted in gorse, um, and they're still relatively easy to see. Um, out in the heaths as well, up in where you've got little patches of, of pine trees, you stand a good chance of finding common crossbill. Um, and all three species of, uh, of reptile, um, occur, sorry, all species of snake um, occur in the new forest in, and uh, the smooth, including the smooth snake. And for, the, for, the, for those interested in, in dragonflies, it's also a great spot to, to look for dragonflies during the summertime when we do day trips to New Forest in the summer um, to look for dragonflies as well as the other birds. And whether you've got lots of dragonflies and you've got plenty of hobbies as well. Although sadly again, hobby is another bird that has declined um, in the forest. It's not quite so easy to see as it used to be in the past. Um, at, at dusk, we'll head out onto the, onto the heaths and um, hope to enjoy that the, the, the classic um, nocturnal um, experience, birding experience of the forest, and as with the forest of Dean, this is of course the, the chairing of the nightjar, the nightjars are, are, are common around the, the woodland edges um, in, in the new forest, and you often also get roving woodcock um, over the top as well. There are butterflies to enjoy, um, so there's a, a pearl-bordered fritillary here, and then we also go back to the forest in the autumn, um, not only to enjoy the wonderful autumn colours, but to see um, a range of different birds at, at this time of year as the, as the finch flocks start to return. There are a whole finch roosts um, as well. Tom was mentioning about brambling in the Forest of Dean. Well, brambling also occur in the New Forest as well. And we got winter trips looking for brambling, looking for hoar finch, and um, maybe even lesser spotted woodpecker um, as well. We have got our, our later winter trips run end of February early March time when the lesser spots start drumming and the goshawks uh, start to, to display. And if you're lucky, maybe great grey shrike too, but as Tom was saying, it's not been a very good year for great grey shrikes this year. I'm only aware of maybe one or two birds that wintered in the new forest this year. And for a change of habitat, since the forest is right on the, the uh, comes down to the, to the, to the Solans, to the, to the sea, 
will also take you down to the coast, down to the, the coastal marshes around Penton and Key Haven to enjoy the, the wintering um, geese and ducks that, um, that spend the winter months um, along the coast here, along with uh, little egrets, um, marsh harriers, peregrine, uh, a, a variety of, of waders as well. So I think it's now yes, quarter past eight. So I will end my talk um, here and then pass over to Kerry. And I think we're going to have a, have a break. Thanks very much, Paul. Yes, indeed, we are going to have a short break for um, exactly 10 minutes. You and Tom have done perfect jobs this evening and ended right on time. So um, please go and refresh any drinks, um, get yourself some tweets, whatever you'd like to do, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, hopefully Alison is here and ready and raring to go with the next part of our evening. Oh, oh yes, Alison, I'm ready to go. Um, so good evening everybody. Um, it's nice to have you join us this oh, evening. Alison, hot um, hey. Let me just um, share, share my presentation with you so you can see what I'm going to be talking Possibly on. Just, oh yeah, sorry. That was me. All right. I'll turn my music down. <laughs> There you go. Hopefully you should now be able to, to see my screen. So that's perfect. Hopefully. All right. OK, so um, my name is Alison. I'm one of the operations managers at Nature Track um, and I've not been there quite as long as Paul. I've been there for about six years. Um, so a fair way to go to catch up with him. Um, the tours I'm going to be talking about this evening um, basically take us to the two extremes of our English tours um, that we do, um, talking about Northumberland and then heading right down into the southwest um, into Devon and then down to the Isles of Scilly. Um, so we're going to start up in the north, up at Northumberland. Um, I'm sure most of you know um, Northumberland is right up on the east coast of England, um, as far as you can get up on that side without actually going into Scotland itself. We offer a couple of different tours to here. We offer a six day birding tour and a five day photography tour, um, both of which are set in the summer months, um, particularly to focus on um, the seabirds um, and other visitors that come up during the summertime. Now we stay in one of um, the smaller hotels along in one of the villages um, near the coast and um, with easy access to the different sites that we want to visit. So Depending on uh, the tour we're on, whether we're on um, birding tour or photography tour, we do visit a variety of different sites, um, but some of them are common between them and also offer um, a good variety of interest um, regardless of where we're going. So starting on some of the local pools um, along the coastal region, um, we'll be looking for a number of waders, um, including species such as avocet, um, perhaps oyster catcher as well. Um, and the pools are also a very good place to look out for herondines, um, so swallows um, and martens, um, as well as a number of different ducks as well. As we're heading round, uh, we'll be looking out for um, bright um, but, um, patches of colour, which are the, um, the local emblem of Northumberland, um, the Bloody Cranes Bill, um, creating um, nice splashes uh, around the countryside um, as we go. One of the days we'll be heading out to Lindisfarne. Uh, we obviously have to time this visit quite carefully um, because the causeway is only um, accessible um, during the low points of the tide. So the day that we get visit there will really vary depending on um, which days um, the tide is um, at its lowest. There's plenty of interest out in Lindisfarne and um, historical interest such as um, Lindisfarne Castle, um, but also the Priory um, and other um, buildings of interest as well. For those on the birding tour, it's a great place to do some sea watching and species we'll be looking out for particularly um, include goosander, gannets, uh, perhaps some bar-tailed godwit around the shore. Um, and if we're very fortunate, there may be um, a pod or two of bottlenose dolphin um, playing out in the waves. Both on Lindisfarne and around the coastal habitat, um, we'll be looking out for um, orchids um, as well um, as, as birds. Um, the dune habitat and coastal regions are particularly good uh, for a number of different species. Um, perhaps the um, 
the, the spikes of the, the lovely northern marsh orchid um, or the more delicate uh, bee orchid that we can find in places as well. These are particularly small and can often be missed if you're not sure what you're looking for. During the photography tour, uh, we take advantage of the, uh, the features around the coast, um, including the castles uh, that are around, um, and they are fantastic places to do some creative photography, and um, perhaps using um, the different stages of, of the tide or pools to create some reflections. In. It's also a very um, interesting part of the coast for different um, rarities turning up um, and some bit interesting visitors uh, can be found from time to time, um, including um, something, oh, I'm really sorry that picture doesn't uh, want to come through. Um, last year our group had a species such as redneck stint um, and other waders that can turn up um, during, um, during the spring or summer months as well. During the week, we'll take a couple of boat trips um, on the birding tour, particularly one is out to Coquette Island, uh, where there is a colony of breeding roseate terns, um, very, very elegant birds with their lovely uh, rosy blush um, down their tummy. For many people, a highlight is heading on out to the Farne Islands. Landings on the islands are very, very dependent on weather and also uh, whether access is currently being allowed. But whether or not we're able to land, it's a wonderful place to go to experience um, the seabird colonies. Um, the sound and the noise and the smell of being there is something that's very hard to describe if you've never seen one. Species we're looking out for um, include the, the puffins, uh, guillemots, razorbills, kittiwakes, shags and a variety of gulls as well. If we do it onto the islands, you particularly have to watch out for, for these birds, the Arctic tern. They're very territorial and very protective of their nesting spots. So uh, it's usually advised to wear a hat. Otherwise you can come away with um, uh, a little bit of a war wound if you tangle with those um, on the islands. Our birding tour also has a day inland heading up into the Cheviot Hills. We'll be looking for some upland species, including grouse, ring ousel, whinchat and ravens. Moving on, going right down to the opposite end of the country now, um, talking a little bit about our Devon tours. One of the reasons that we visit Devon, and particularly in South Devon, is the X estuary. It's a fantastic place, um, particularly in the winter and spring months, um, for visiting waders and wildfowl. So water birds such as the avocet and brent geese um, can be found in um, big flocks sometimes um, and again um, can make a fantastic display if they get disturbed and come up in, in a big show. Other ones we'll be looking for um, include the oyster catcher. Um, sometimes it takes um, a little while to appreciate the, the beauty of the birds um, when people who've never seen one before remark on them and we sometimes take them for granted. Also, um, bar-tailed godwit are around, and um, perhaps some um, grey plover, um, dunlin or not, curlew, redshank or greenshank, sanderling or turnstones. A whole lot of different species can turn up there, and we never know quite what we're going to find from year to year and trip to trip. Out on the water, particularly in the winter, we'll come across some of the sort of diving species, um, including Slavonian grebe um, or um, red-throated diver in their winter plumage. Perhaps scoter or red-breasted naganser as well. One of the other um, fish-eating birds, which many people love to see, but much smaller, is the kingfisher. Um, and if we're fortunate, we'll find these. Um, often in the winter months, they um, head down towards the coast. Um, to, to, um, to for the, some sea fishing, um, so it's a good chance of being able to see them when they gather um, there. Might be a little bit um, unapparent, but uh, male kingfishers are a blue-green and females are a green-blue, which doesn't sound like much distinction until you see them next to each other, and sometimes you can really see the difference between them. We also head on our tours out to um, the marshes and heathland areas where we'll be looking for species such as the Dartford warbler. If we're very fortunate, perhaps some surabunting, which are fairly restricted in their range in the UK. Perhaps linnet or some flocks of crossbill as well. On our spring tours, 
looking out from the points out to sea, I'd uh, be looking out for species um, such as um, Manx shearwater or gannets, perhaps passing in some number. The scrub areas are good places to listen and look out for Chetty's warbler with their explosive song um, and loud call, um, quite a, a remarkable for the size of bird that they are. But we'll also focus on um, some of the other wildlife around as well and, and, um, and not just a fauna, flora too, um, perhaps finding species such as the spring squill with its lovely blue flowers. Again, there's a possibility down here of a pearl bordered fritillary. Um, and a uh, number of other butterfly species too. Heading out to Dartmoor from here, um, it's a good chance to look out for some more upland species, um, including uh, wind chat and stone chat, perhaps finding some reed bunting in the areas or perhaps some red grouse. And again, there's a possibility here of nightjar, either hearing or seeing. Back around in the coastal regions around the X estuary, um, we can find um, other invertebrate species, such as this hairy dragonfly. Um, although we enjoy watching these, um, they make a very tasty snack uh, for some hawking hobbies. On a warm day as well, it may also be possible to find some sand lizards hiding amongst the dune systems. On the north side, at the opposite end of Devon, is Exmoor. Um, although our tour to Exmoor doesn't technically um, lie within Devon, it's, it's worth a mention. Um, the Exmoor um, is split between uh, Devon and Somerset. Um, and it's a fantastically ancient landscape uh, defined by geography um, as well as centuries of human influence as well. In the evenings, again, possibilities of nightjar, but perhaps also some owls such as tawny owl uh, can be found if we find the right place. Spring's a great time for returning migrants um, and uh, they come to breed in places like Horner Wood, um, including Pied Flycatcher and Wood Warbler, Red Start and Marsh Tit, Tree Pipit, Mistle Thrush, Bullfinch, often everybody's uh, favourite, um, and Willow Warbler as well. Around the streams, we'll be looking out for Dipper and Grey Wagtail. Um, grey wagtail with their lovely uh, bobbing motion um, and uh, call as they head overhead. Places like Holscombe are fairly interesting. They are um, a test land management site um, designated for um, the recovery of the Heath Patilly butterfly. Um, and if we uh, time it just right and the conditions are perfect, we may find some of those during our tour as well. Out on the heathland, we'll be looking for species such as cuckoo, merlin, wheat ear, green woodpecker, and red pole. And there's also mammals on the moor as well, including uh, large um, herds of red deer, one of the larger herds of red deer within the UK, native Exmoor ponies, which are one of the most ancient breeds um, in the world, um, and perhaps brown hare as well. Moving on again, going right, right out, um, way off the coast of the mainland, um, right off the southwest point lie the Isles of Scilly. Never the Scilly Isles, I've been told, always the Isles of Scilly. It's an island archipelago, which is made up of five main islands, um, St Mary's, Tresco, Briar, St Agnes and St Martin's. It's a stunning location, um, often known to, for its sparkling blue seas um, and gloriously sandy beaches. The warmer climate is influenced by the Gulf Stream, um, which has the effect of making it um, a good place for raising exotic plants, such as those found um, in the Tresco Abbey Gardens, um, and also uh, well known for the cut flower industry. We offer a spring trip, particularly looking for flowers, um, as well as a visit to the gardens. We'll be looking for some of the more wild species as well, and perhaps um, something like come across this field of brilliant red poppies. Some species are more common here than on the mainland, um, but there's also um, some that are um, less, that are scarce here. Um, but among the species we'll look for um, include uh, the western ramping fumitory, the small flowered catchfly, or perhaps the lovely altar lilies. 
there are a couple of very local specialities uh, which can be found on the islands too, including the least adder's tongue, fern, um, and the dwarf pansy, which is a very, very diminutive little plant uh, with uh, flowers often being only a few millimetres across. There's plenty of other wildlife to be found there too, um, including uh, species that, that uh, will um, feed on the flowers, um, including small tortoiseshell and painted lady. And there's a very local variation of the speckled wood butterfly as well. And we might find something um, that's a bit more uh, ground based, such as um, this stunning minotaur beetle. On the boat trips between islands, um, it's possible to find um, marine species, including grey seal, perhaps some common dolphin, um, maybe in a little pod or perhaps um, in a large family group, and maybe one or two um, harbour porpoise as well, or something a little bit more unusual, like the ocean sunfish. And you're not going to be able to ignore the seabirds. They are um, going to be um, all around you um, and we also run a tourist to the Isles of Scilly that are particularly uh, for, for birds, both in the springtime and the autumn. The spring is when you're going to most notice the seabirds and we're looking for species such as gannet, guillemots and razorbills um, and perhaps everyone's favourite, uh, the puffin as well. As with anywhere in the UK, weather can be a little bit changeable. Um, we can have some fantastically uh, sunny weeks um, where almost every day is uh, glorious blue skies um, and warm weather. But other days it may be a little bit damp, but regardless of that, there's still plenty of birding to be enjoyed. Due to its location, it can often end up with some very unusual visitors and particularly during migration times. In the pools, um, like uh, both Paul and Tom were talking about in um, the um, Somerset levels and um, other places like that, uh, you can have some European species turn up, um, such as purple heron, um, little bittern, um, and a number of other water birds. Some rare waders that our groups have seen in the last couple of years um, include species such as beards or petrel sandpipers. Rails are also possible as well, um, including the uh, lovely spotted creek uh, that can be found as well. More typical migrants though, um, include meadow pipit and wheat ear, black cap and white throat. Um, and it's quite a, um, it's not so unusual to find um, um, the less common ones from the mainland, such as the yellow blind warbler here, which can come through in some numbers, particularly in the autumn time. But wherever you happen to go on the Isles of Scilly and whatever you're going to be doing, you're sure to find that there is some fantastic scenery around you. Right from the moment when you arrive to the moment you get back on the ferry in St Mary's to head home. And even then, there'll still be some seabirds and perhaps some marine life to spot on the way home. It's also possible to fly to join the tour um, and we're very happy to look into that for anyone who wants to know more about those kind of options. So that's been a little bit of a brief overview of some of our tours um, that we offer here um, and I just want to say thank you very much for listening and um, if you've got any questions um, do feel free to put them in the question and answer section um, and we'll try and answer them for you. Um, so I'm going to pass over now to Matthew um, so that um, he can um, take you on um, another British adventure. Thank you very much. Thank you Alison. I hope everybody can, uh, can hear me okay. I will see if I can Get my screen shared. Is that? Uh, yeah, looking good. Working okay. Let's go full screen. Excellent. Perfect. Right. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, it's really, really good to, to be with you from um, Derbyshire. It's been a lovely sunny day up here today. Um, my name is uh, is Matthew Kappa, and um, as Kerry said earlier, I'm a, a nature trek guide in my spare time. So um, my day job is with Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. Um, so uh, I head up their people engagement and communications department. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk to you this evening about a couple of short breaks um, that I put together for, for Nature Trek over the last couple of years when uh, we haven't been able to, to go quite so far afield, um, but we are now making them 
uh, sort of permanent fixtures of, of what we do, which is, which is great. Both of these are, are four day tours. Um, so we have, I have two destinations for you. One is um, the east coast of Yorkshire uh, called the Magic of Migration. Uh, and the other one is, uh, is the Peak District in spring. So um, first one, start with, start with Yorkshire and the Magic of Migration. Um, we, we basically have run this several times through September and October for the last two years. Uh, and it is centered around two of the best um, migration spots um, for, for birding, um, probably in the UK really, with all due respect to some of the other destinations this evening, I'm maybe slightly biased because um, I've been birding uh, at both of these places since the early 1990s when I uh, arrived in Sheffield to do my, uh, to do my degree. Uh, and I've spent many happy days, um, both in the spring and the autumn, uh, birding in these areas and, and seeing lots of really good birds. And it's called the magic of migration for, for good reason. And you can see here from the map that just the, the geography, um, Paul talked earlier about how the East Coast um, funnels migrants across from Scandinavia, you get a, an easterly wind, um, and, and birds come across the North Sea and then they hit the east coast of the UK. And you can see here that both Spurn and Flamborough are sticking out into the, um, the North Sea uh, and both have this effect of, of funneling birds down as they're moving southwards if they reorientate themselves. But they're also often the first bit of land that tired migrants see as they, as they cross the North Sea. So, so this is a, a really um, fantastic place if you want to see migration in action. And we stay uh, in, a, in a village called Patrington. Um, we stay here, this is the Dunedin Hotel. Um, it's very well appointed, nice rooms. Uh, and we do, um, if people want, we can do a pick up and uh, drop off at Hull Station for anybody who wants to come by train. And in Patrington, we're only about 20 minutes away from Spurn and probably just under an hour away from uh, Flamborough, which uh, means that it, it, it's very well located. And we'll spend a couple of days at Spurn. And Spurn Point is a very long, narrow spit of land that runs down parallel to the coast and snakes round the entrance to the, to the Humber estuary. Um, so we're a bit further east of, of Hull and we have um, Lincolnshire further south from us. You can see over to Grimsby from, from the point itself. Um, you have the Humber estuary on one side and the North Sea on the other. So very much a, a coastal site, but that narrow spit of land, as I said earlier, it funnels migrants. It's a major, major um, concentration point for birds that are, are heading da um, down the uh, east coast of the UK. Uh, and they head down, they hit Spurn, and then they have to cross over the Humber and on into, into Lincolnshire. So um, it has a really nice variety with that um, land birds coming through, but also all of the sea and also the estuary as well. And this is what it's all about, really. This is um, seeing migration in action. So when the conditions are right, it can be truly spectacular here. Um, if we have a classic easterly wind, um, then these things may be abundant. So um, this is a, a lovely gold crest, literally weighs pretty much the same as a 20 pence piece. And if these have been coming across the North Sea, and if we've got a little bit of um, low cloud or drizzle on the East Coast, they will literally see land and they don't wanna go any further. So they dive in and find the first bit of shelter that they can, they're exhausted from making that crossing. And sometimes you can literally have hundreds of these birds, not just in every bush, but also just sometimes on the ground, you know, they're literally sitting on the beach having just made landfall. It is um, not something that you're going to get all the time, but if you get the conditions right, you really do, do get an amazing experience. And you get visible migration as well. So, uh, if the winds are from the south, then species like meadow pipit may be coming over in the hundreds or even sometimes they're thousands. Um, there's a spot locally called Numpties where we can stand and watch the visible migration. And as the autumn progresses, the meadow pipits will give way to things like the winter thrushes. And these tend to come in at a bit more height and then they spiral down when they see the land. <clears throat> we have one trip where um, we just saw out a little bit of a rain shower. We got out of the car after the rain had finished. 
and several hundred red wings just spiraled out of the sky into the bushes next to the car park right in the middle of the bush with them was a stunning ring oozle. So um, it's really fantastic when you can just stop and watch these things um, right in front of you. I think every single one of us this evening has mentioned this species. So um, this is a, a yellow-browed warbler. Used to be a real um, scarcity, but now becoming much more regular. And we, we're getting several hundred of these every autumn on, on the East Coast, right from the sort of top to the bottom of the UK. But it does mean that it's almost a species that we, we would expect to see on uh, one of our autumn trips to the east coast of Yorkshire now. Um, and so with all those common migrants, you're getting these rarities, you're getting these scarcities, things like yellow-browed world is expected, but the list of rarities is pretty much as long as your arm. Um, so you never know what you're going to get on any of the trips and every single trip, it's something different. Could be something like this stunning thing here, like a red flanked blue tail. Um, and we have a, a radio with us. We borrow one of the radios um, from the from the local um, bird observatory. The birders there have this uh, network of radios, so we have one of those. So we're literally listening in to the news of everything as it unfolds through the day. So we're literally first on the scene if anything turns up, which is great. And that coastal in influence with the, with the estuary means we get a big range of wetland birds as well. So things again are moving through. So it's all about migration still. Um, we might get a little stint. We might get Bartel Godwit, Curly Sandpiper down here in the left uh, hand corner, um, a one that we've had on most of the trips. Um, there might be Brent geese. We get things like hooper swans and pink footed geese going through. So there's always something, even if it's not the classic kind of fall migration for the small birds, there's lots of other migration going on as well. And there's been a bird observatory here at Spurn since the 1930s. Um, and we've, we've teamed up with them um, to, to make these trips uh, a little bit more um, rich in, in experience. Um, so they very kindly run a moth trap for us um, on one of the mornings. Um, we used to run the moth trap in the grounds of the hotel, um, but we found that actually being over the observatory is a little bit better. Uh, as you can see here from the photo on the left, uh, one of the trips I was setting up the moth trap and there was a, a wedding reception going on in the background. And it's the only time that I've explained moth trapping to uh, a bride and groom, which was, uh, which was quite good fun. Um, Moth here on the right is probably the best moth we've had so far, which was a Clifton nonpareil, um, which was uh, last year on a, on a trip that I wasn't leading, but uh, that was the third ever record for sperm. And again, you know, this is migration in action. This is a moth that had come across probably from Eastern Europe. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a big one. You can see the hand there gives a little bit of scale to the size of this, bird, um, of this moth. And the other thing that the observatory uh, guys do for us very kindly is a ringing demonstration. Uh, and these are always very popular. Being able to see birds close up in the hand and have an expert like Paul the Warden who takes you through the, the finer identification points and talks about the journeys that they've made. And um, we've had Firecrest on a couple of these uh, ringing demonstrations, which you can see here. Uh, one of them, we had a, a fantastic long-eared owl in the hand, which was amazing. Um, probably the best one that we've had um, was this one, which was a, a female rustic bunting. Um, Paul the Warden has a very good poker face. He, he came back with four bags and, and he drew out a black cap for the first one. He could have said, I found something amazing. He said nothing. Um, he just drew out the black cap, talked us through it, and then he then said, oh, and you might be interested in this. Uh, drew out this, uh, this fantastic rustic bunting. Um, you can see it's a rustic bunting because it's very similar to reed bunting, but you can see the white wing bars here and there's a little white patch between those two creamy bars on the head, which distinguishes it from, uh, from the reed bunting. But definitely a really good rarity to, to get on that particular tour. And we also um, take a trip with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. So they take us down Sperm Point itself. So it's quite hard to get down the point these days because the, the road washed away in 2012. Um, but they now have this um, ex-military vehicle that you can see here called a Unimog. Uh, and they take us down the point on a, on a, on a safari down there. And um, we're able to, to head down to places that we wouldn't have been able to go otherwise, including 
being able to go up the lighthouse with uh, one of their guides. We had a fantastic view from the top, as you can see here, it gives you a nice view back down the, the point. Um, there's some fantastic military history down here. So there was lots of um, military activity during the Second World War. We get to have a look around there as well. So even if it's slightly quiet for birds, it's really interesting place to be. But we might get Black Red Star down here. We might get a Rhinek or something like that, which is uh, um, really, really nice. And we spend a day up the coast at Flamborough Head near Bridlington. So Flamborough sticks out about four miles into the North Sea. Um, which again makes it a really good migrant trap, but also means it's very good for sea watching because birds heading up the east coast following the, the coastline, when they hit Flamborough sticking out, they tend to follow around the edge and they come in a lot closer. So um, there's a sea watching hide there that we tend to have a bit of a, a look at. Um, and we also um, tend to go to the uh, RSPB reserve at Bempton Cliffs just up the road as well. There's some nice little woodland spots here, such as at South Landing, and we might get uh, lots of siskins or things like this brambling here, which uh, was photographed there a couple of years back. Um, the brambles at the headland might have something like this barred warbler, which we saw um, on one of the trips. We've also had one at Spurn as well. Um, we've mentioned shrikes, so we've had um, great grey shrike on the trips, but we've also had red back shrike. Uh, we had this uh, lovely um, juvenile woodchuck shrike uh, on the first one that I ran a couple of years back. So a really good track record of, of shrikes as well on the trip. And we generally go to Bempton if we can. So this is uh, one of the groups bird watching here at Bempton Cliffs. Um, most of the orcs and the puffins have left by this time, but they might be out on the sea. Um, but the, the gannets will still be breeding right through to into November, so there will be thousands of those. There's about 13,000 pairs of, of gannets and about 300,000 seabirds use the site in the summer. Um, and there's also the dell, which also picks up migrants like pied flycatcher. Um, and there might be peregrine hunting along the cliffs. Um, it's a good spot for short-eared owl. We've even had harper porpoise and um, these things here we had on one of the trips, some bottlenose dolphins going past. We haven't had it yet, but this particular bird spent the summer last year at Bempton Cliff. I photographed this. This is a photo I took um, earlier in the summer. Um, our first trip last autumn arrived about four days after this thing was last seen. This is a black brown albatross, the only one probably in the northern hemisphere. Uh, in the Atlantic anyway. And um, hopefully this thing may come back because it's been around for a couple of years now. And if we can time it right, who knows, next year, we might even add black browed albatross to the list uh, on, the, on one of these tours, which would be good. And, and to end this particular tour, just really this, this bird um, on one of the tours, uh, one of the trips last year, just really sums up what you just don't know what you're gonna get at, um, at Spurn and Flamborough. Um, anything can turn up anywhere. And um, the observatory garden literally just has a garden pond. Um, and the group were wandering around, um, just, just having a mooch around, looking for things. And this jacksnipe literally dropped in, came through, dropped in, found the first bit of habitat that it thought was suitable, and literally just walked around this small, literally three foot by four foot garden pond in the observatory garden. And people got these amazing views of this bird. So it just sums up what for me is, is truly the magic of migration here on, on the East Coast. And the second destination is um, the stunning Peak District. Um, so this is a, a trip that we ran um, for the first time last year. It goes in late spring, so the end of May. Uh, and you can see here, this is a, a, a very basic outline of the, of the Peak District, but uh, um, it shows you just where we are in, in an England context, right in the center um, of, uh, of the UK. Um, and, and I live on the edge of the Peak District now, but I used to live right in the heart of the Peak District. And I was um, a National Park Ranger for 10 years in my spare time. Um, so it's definitely an area that I, I know and love. And it is a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, it's the second most visited national park in the world, and for very good reason. 
Um, down in the south, it's dominated by the limestone valleys, but we're up in, in what is known as the Dark Peak, up in the north of the National Park. Gritstone ridges and moorland plateaus dominated by heather moorland, as you can see here. And we base ourselves in a village called Hathersage in the Hope Valley. Um, and um, this is the George Hotel. So um, it's very, very close, just 500 meters walk from the train station. So easy to get to if you want to come by rail. And one of the habitats that we really do focus on here is, is the Derbyshire Moors. These are of international importance, these moorlands for their, their peat um, and their, their moorland habitats open landscape, a lot of it is managed for grouse shooting, but there are also some large estates managed by organisations such as the National Trust and the RSPB, uh, and we go to some of those sites during the course of the, of the trip. Um, we go to the uh, Upper Derwent Valley, the photo on the right here is, uh, is the group last year stood at uh, Winstonley Tor, which overlooks uh, Lady Bower and uh, Derwent Reservoirs. Um, so we do see some, some stunning scenery and have some nice walks while we're, while we're out and about. And we look for special birds such as this, uh, which is one of my favourite birds, the ring oozel. Um, the first ones actually have just returned to the Peak District in the last couple of days. We just had the first ones coming back. Um, and this is probably now, because we've lost them from the southwest, it's probably about as far south in the UK as you can reliably find them breeding now. So um, we have a very good site for them, which uh, is, is normally pretty reliable, I have to say. And red grouse will be present in numbers. Um, the distinctive kind of go back, go back call is something that you hear um, as a backdrop to these, to these walks in the moorland areas. And these sort of summer migrants, the wind chats, and this uh, lovely bird here, the wheat ear, we'll, we'll get those as we're walking along. Um, some of these uh, moorland paths. Um, and I have to say, um, this is one species that nobody else has mentioned this evening. So I, I do have a nice one uh, here that nobody else uh, is gonna get on any of their trips, uh, mountain hare. So this is the only place in England where you're going to get mountain hare. Normally you have to go to Scotland. These were actually introduced in the 1800s for shooting, but they're not shot now and they're left alone and they're doing uh, relatively well. Um, they do still turn white in the winter, but we don't get as much snow, so they do tend to stand out like a sore thumb at that time of year, as you can see here from the photo. And the River Derwent runs through Hathersage, so we'll take a little walk along here looking for dipper and grey wagtail, and you might get mandarin along here and a nice selection of woodland birds. Dippers are always good value, so we try and build in uh, a little bit of a, a dipper stop on the trip. And then I have to admit that I do um, throw in a slight curveball on this trip and take people for a day outside of the Peak District to the South Yorkshire coal fields. Um, am I selling it to you? Um, I have to say the reason I do this because it adds a huge amount of variety and it's a fantastic place. I used to be site manager here for the RSPB. So I managed a nature reserve, chain of reserves. If you've heard of RSPB Old Moor, uh, I used to manage this. Um, it isn't in the Peak District, but it's less than an hour away. And it's got a fascinating history and a really super selection of uh, wetland birds. So it adds variety to the trip. And it also means that um, it's the law that if you come on this trip with me, that you have to go and you learn all about the fascinating history. So. This is the, uh, the Wathmain Colliery in the 1960s. By the 1990s, the coal industry had collapsed and everything was bulldozed. And this particular bit of the Derm Valley was the most polluted ex-industrial site in Western Europe at the time. I told you I was going to sell it to you, didn't I? Um, but it has been transformed from this wasteland that you wouldn't have thought would ever have any life or any wildlife value at all to a nationally important chain of wetlands. As you can tell, I'm incredibly proud of the role that I played in, in helping um, this transformation. So it's lovely to take people here and show them around and talk about and show some of the fantastic birds that we have here. So um, this is one of the things that I'm most proud of in my conservation career. This is the first bittern to fledge in South Yorkshire, probably for hundreds of years back in 2012. There are now a couple of booming males, two or three nests every year. 
And we should have a good chance of seeing those on feeding flights across the reeds at that time of year. We have breeding bearded tit, we have breeding marsh harrier, we have breeding avocet, as you can see here. Lots of other wading birds, lots of other ducks and various things to see. So to take this place from this most polluted uh, site in Western Europe to now a triple SI with all of that wildlife is something that I really love to share with people. And then we head back to the Peak District and uh, as well as these moorland walks, uh, we take in some of the lovely woodlands. Um, so this is uh, Longshore, which is a National Trust site, and it's hugely atmospheric. These twisted and gnarly oak trees. Um, if any of you know Lord of the Rings, you almost expect to see Ents come walking through this woodland. It's got that ancient feel to it. It's superb. And I think both Paul and Tom mentioned these things, that pied flycatchers breed in here. There's lots of nest boxes provided for them. So we have good numbers of pairs and we should get those as we wander around here. They're not as common as they used to be, but again, we go looking for wood warbler um, and we'll get lots of other woodland birds along this walk, tree creepers and nut hatches and all the sort of things that you'd expect. And then just to end really with this, um, this particular trip, the moorland fringe up here in the Peak District can be really, really productive for birds. You've got the fields, you've got the heather moorland, you've got the woodland edge, and it really has a high density of breeding waders. So we tend to go, we choose from the forecast the best evening that we can, and we head up here in the evening after dinner, and it is so atmospheric because we'll have these things drumming away, snipe overhead with the call that they, well not call, it's using the, the vibration of the feathers, as you can see here, the feathers vibrate as they drop through the air. But also we're going to have curlew bubbling away. We're going to have red grouse calling in the background. We're going to have cuckoos. We're going to have um, woodcock roading around. So woodcock and snipe. Um, it's, it's really just a beautiful place to stand on a still early well, summer's evening and, and listen to all of these noises. And then we head round just literally a few hundred yards around the corner to a site where we hope to see long-eared owl hunting out over the moorland. It's a, a site where they regularly nest, so we have a good track record here. Um, I say good track record, we've done it once, but I have a good track record over the years of always turning up here and being able to see long-eared owl hunting backwards and forwards, taking food into the woodland to, to their chicks. So we, we hope to get those and get you nice views of these. And then again, I think most people have mentioned these this evening, but uh, the sort of final bird that then starts up right at the very end of the evening is nightjar. And they tend to, to sort of fly out over the moorland and uh, we can hear them chirring. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful way to end um, that particular evening. Um, and a really nice way, I think, to uh, end the, uh, the talk really about uh, the Peak District. So two destinations that mean a huge amount to me. These are trips that are very personal to me. Um, I would be delighted to, to share them with you one day if you are ever interested to come along. Um, but that's it. I'm happy to take any questions, put them in the chat. We've got a question and answer session coming up. But, uh, but that's it. Back to, uh, back to Kerry. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, and to everyone, in fact, for some lovely, lovely talks this evening. So, well, everyone's back very promptly. Thank you all. Um, and we'll, we'll go to a few questions. So um, I'm going to kick off. Helen has just popped in the chat. Any plans for trips to Wales or Scotland? I realise we have called this the British Breaks evening, um, having only covered England throughout the whole evening, um, mostly because we dedicated an entire um, evening to Scotland um, just before Christmas, actually. And anyone who wants to watch that can, can catch up on our website, all, all the talks there on them recorded. Um, so yeah, we, we spent a whole evening on Scotland before Christmas. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, Alice and I particularly can tell you we, we're going all over this year, aren't we, to, to Scotland. Um, we'll come back to Wales in a sec. Uh, yeah, pretty much, uh, pretty much the uh, length and breadth of Scotland. Um, we've got tours right up in um, Shetland and Orkney, um, right out to the Western Isles. Um, trips to the, so um, Lewis, Harris, uh, Uist, 
um, Isla and Mull, places like that. Um, East Coast Scotland as well, so northeast Scotland, um, and then down to Dumfries and Galloway, um, coming through at Cairn Gorms and Space Side in the middle as well. So quite a lot of options up that way. A few, few um, things going on. Feel yeah. free to get in touch if you want to know what you can see in different places too. Yeah, and Tommy, you've been busy putting some new trips together in Wales, I think. Have you? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got the um, best of the best of North Wales in in, in winter and. And in spring now, around sort of Anglesey and Semlin Bay and some of the areas up there. And we've also had a, a tour to Pembrokeshire for, for quite a number of years. Yeah. And so yeah, we could we could do more in Wales, but we're we're we're, we're slowly adding more. Um, there's yeah. a lot a lot to offer there. We've got a few tours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a few day trips I think as well, aren't there as well? Yeah, yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah. Gwent, Gwent and other areas. Mm. Perfect. Um, Wendy asked a little bit earlier if these tours are all um, for self-driving or is there shared driving or vans? So that's, yeah, that's an important point that all of these tours, um, we provide the transport um, and in pretty much all cases, we have 90 to minibuses that will be driven by your tour leader. Um, sometimes there'll be two, so two, two seven, seven per vehicle. Um, that is the case for, I think, definitely all the tours we talked about this evening. Um, I can't yeah. think of any exceptions. Um, the only time you walk, unless you obviously get on walk as well. Oh, you mean since sillies, yes, yeah, sillies, yeah, no vehicles, lovely. It's just the day trips that you that you follow um, in your own car. Yeah, but our day trips are a bit different because they were set up during <laughs> COVID times. Yeah, so those ones you arrive in your your own vehicle, and if we need to move around, then you would follow in your own car. Um, there, I think there are uh, the odd one where you could you could get there on public transport or a taxi, and then you're on foot the whole time. Um, a lot of them, yeah, that's when that's the only time we ever have self-driving is those um, UK day trips. Um, that's that one. Um, question from Jacqueline just popped in on the chat. How much walking is involved in these tours? Hmm, I'm going to give that one to Paul. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh, it, yeah, it varies on the tour, but m mostly gentle walks on um, pretty easy terrain there's there's always information on the grading in the tour itineraries that you can download from the website um but mo most of the, the the uk breaks that that we offer um are are pretty easy going and they're not difficult you're, of course when you're looking for birds and wildlife you're always walking at a pretty leisurely pace anyway stopping frequently to look um so then there, there, there may be the occasional day where um, the train might be a bit rougher, but um, that's that's unusual. And it's yeah, just check check the tour itinerary. Yeah. Um, not lots of questions coming in this evening. Anyone else has any? Just pop them in the Q and A or in the in the chat in a moment, and we'll answer them. We were wondering before this evening whether there would be any bird species that all four speakers covered during their talks this evening. Did anyone spot any that that came up in all all four talks? Hello, Brad Warbler. Was that one? Yeah, Brad Warbler. Yeah. Night jar. Uh, well, Night jar. Someone yeah, suggested. Yellow Brad wasn't in mine. Wood Warbler. Oh, wood warbler. oh sorry, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. Nearly. Maybe, maybe we didn't wood. manage it. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone also asked Rosie asked about um, chiff chaffs, Tom. You, you typed a question, but I'm not sure whether everyone gets to see that. She said, um, "Haven't heard you mention the chiff chaff. Are they doing well?" Yeah, I think they. My understanding is they're doing pretty well, actually. I think they've in, you know, increased in recent years and pretty stable at the moment. But that's my understanding. So Chief, whether yeah. anyone else thinks differently. Chiff Chaff are doing well. Willow Warbler is not so well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting um, how Willow Warbler are, are disappearing from the southeast. Um, a lot, a lot of um, species like Willow Warbler, um, Wood Wood Warbler, which we mentioned, they seem to be sort of retreating northwards and westwards, but. But Chiff Chaff uh, bucking that trend, they're doing very well. I was, I've been hearing them now singing for the last week up here, so they're definitely, definitely back. Um, spotted flycatcher, another question: How are they doing? Anyone to point to that one? Mm. Yeah, not so good. <laughs> not so good. Yeah. Um, yeah, typically, you know, you know talking to the Forest of Dean, the, the numbers of sort of been slowly tailing off. Um, yeah, certainly not found as frequently. And typically in years gone by, you'd find them in, you know, gardens, certainly around the Cotswolds, you know, with, you know quite frequently. And, and that just doesn't happen anymore. But they, you know, they, they, they are, you know, they're still breeding the Forest of Dean and we see them on most of our spring visits, but in, in much smaller numbers than, than they used to be, sadly. 
they are doing they are hanging on okay in the peak district right. so so yeah in my area if you're if you're on the east of the peak district you you don't see them very often at all um but head west from chesterfield out into the peak district up into some of the uh, the woodlands up there places like longshaw um as well as getting the pied flycatcher we would expect to get spotted flycatcher so they're, they're doing okay in, in those areas Stuff. Thanks guys. Um, Marie says, I don't have a car. Are these tours near train stations? Um, or most of them are, aren't they? Mostly our pickup points are a train station or sometimes an airport and a train station. Um, Only for the majority of our Norfolk tours, we can arrange a pickup at um, Norwich Railway Station. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking to all Pick up and drop off at Norwich Railway Station. Yeah, yeah. certainly for mine, I, I go past Hull on the way so we're always happy to pick up and drop off at Hull Station for the East Coast one uh, and, and as I say with the Peak District one you're 500 metres walk from the station um, in Hathersedge which is on the Sheffield to Manchester line um, and so if you go to either Sheffield or Manchester and then it's just a hop across um, to, to Hathersedge and then it's just a 500 metre walk from, uh, from the station to the hotel so it's nice and easy. And actually, yeah. the, um, the, the, the hotel we use for a lot of our new forest breaks is actually at Bewley Road Railway Station. Um, so, again, for the new forest, you can quite easily, we can easily get a, get a train um, that go, go to Southampton and change to Southampton um, for Bewley Road. Yeah, it's possible, again, for the Forest of Dean and, and the Somerset levels, trains in Lydney, we do a pickup, or it's a very short, short taxi ride from, from Lydney Station. And into the into the levels as possible too, so we can almost always sort yeah. of make it make it work. Yeah, yeah, yours were the same, weren't they, Alison? I think we do Newcastle pickups and yeah. yeah. I, again, quite a few of the itineraries will tell you where we offer pickups from, just to give you an idea. And um, so on the website, if you want, if you're interested, most of the itineraries will give you an idea about where we can offer pickups from and drop offs at the same at the end of the tour as well. Yeah, perfect. Um, oh, Barbara says, is it possible to do a tour without accommodation? Typically, no, no. Most of our tours, you know, it's a, it's a package, really. Um, and, and part of it is, is being back with the group in the evening and um, discussing your sightings and um, having a drink together. That's that's all makes makes the tour what it is, really. Um, I think probably the only things we might we do, we, um, obviously, our day trips, there is no accommodation. And I think there's a few of them, certainly maybe in... in Peak COVID, I don't know how many now, we used to have a few where you could do one, then another the next day, and if you booked yourself a hotel in between, that would be a way to do it. And we have tailor-made trips as well, and we have leaders all over the UK, so we could always do a couple of tailor-made days out for you. Um, but we wouldn't we wouldn't offer one of our standard tours, minus the accommodation. Um, ooh, a bit of a question from Gil on the, the sillies. I think I'm gonna let us come back to that. Um, from the office, Gil. Um, basically, you can't take your car to the Sillies, so so no. Um, but we can we can let you know how to go about getting there and back, and and we can follow up on that um, after this evening. Um, I think it might be about there, guys. Um, lots. Everyone's appreciating the lovely photos. I think this evening. So thank you to all for that. Um, and we'll leave it there. So. Um, that, as I said at the start, was our penultimate presentation. We have one more. We basically scheduled these between the clocks going back and going forward or which other way around it was. So once the evenings start getting lighter, we don't want to take up any of your time in the evenings. We imagine you'll all be out there doing and botanising and enjoying yourselves again. Um, so, yeah, Matt, we, we all will be. <laughs> so uh, we've got one more to go. Once um, your, your regular host, Sarah Frost, um, is back from... I think she's currently probably kissing a grey whale in Mexico somewhere. Um, we've got our one final evening on um, our wildlife cruises, the second part of wildlife cruises to Canada, to Brazil, to Solomons, to Indonesia. So that's on the 30th of March. So do join us then if you can. That's the last one for this season. And then we'll be back next winter. Um, but thanks again to Paul, to Alison, to Tom and to Matthew for your lovely talks this evening. Um, and good night to everyone. Yes, good night. Good night. Uh, good night, Bye-bye.